Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and I have the pleasure to talk to you today about plants. And this is the beginning of a long discussion about, not particularly this uh, video long discussion, but it's a long discussion about the, the plant, and in particular angiosperms, um, and how their structure, in other words, their anatomy and their particular functionality will lead to growth and development. And so we can think of a plant as sort of a human body. It's an organism, and it's composed of various organs. And those organs, um, for example, like roots, stems, and leaves, and flowers, are each composed of different tissue types. And those tissue types are then composed of different cells. And all those, all those organs um, work together to provide the plant with the ability to get energy and to grow and to reproduce and to ultimately um, survive. And so what I mentioned about angiosperms over here is that you can break plants up, the whole plant kingdom, into two categories. You can say that they're gymnosperms, in other words, plants that produce primitively, although successfully, primitively with cones, and their seeds are not enclosed in a fruit. And angiosperm is a more um, recent plant, and it uh, it reproduces with seeds that enclosed in a in a fruit that came from a flower. And so this is the sort of the emphasis of our conversation is on angiosperms. And so let's get it right into that discussion. And so let's go here and see what happens. And so one of the first things is to say is, is there's there's probably more than uh, 250,000 species. And so that gives you an indication that they're very successful and that they've occupied a, a variety of niches on the earth. And so they're, they've, um, they're successful in their own right. Uh, they've developed uh, alliances with other animals, for example, pollinators. And that's the whole point of a flower, the pollinators are able to help them reproduce. And they've also um, have been um, the friends of humans. And I, when I say the friends of humans, is that, that not only the plants um, reproduce autotrophically, in other words, they produce their own food through photosynthesis, is that they've animals such as humans really depend not only on the, on a, on the oxygen that, the, that these angiosperms produce, but directly from the food that they produce. And so some of our most important plants on the earth include uh, angiosperms. In other words, wheat um, is a great example of that. And so some of the basic ideas, and again, you probably are familiar with them, but the basic organs of a plant are the roots, stems, and leaves. And so um, when you get into each of those organs, you're going to see that there's sort of a hierarchy that, that emerges from when you look at the tissues that comprise those organs and then the cells individually. And so as you can see here, the leaves are composed of, if they're flat like this, this is the a simple leaf. The fat, flat part is called the blade. It's going to be a lot of uh, terms coming your way uh, in this discussion. So the blade and the petiole is the, uh, the leaf branch right there. The stem obviously comprises the the shoot system. And so you have the stem and the leaves uh, coming up here. Cotyledon are these embryonic leaves that form when the uh, when the stem emerges from the seed. And then below the ground is the root system, which is comprised of the roots. And so, um, go back to that. So we're going to look at the various organs and tissues and cells that make up a, a, a plant. And so I mentioned that angiosperms are this, these flowering plants that produce fruits and seeds, seeds enclosed in a fruit, but even angiosperms can be subdivided into two cl classification schemes called monocots and dicots, short for cotyledon and dicotyledon, monocot and dicot. It won't seem so significant as I go over these, but it will emerge over the next several chapters when we start talking about differences between these two. So right out of the gate, just sort of you can see this, but a corn is, an, is a g great example of a monocot. It has one embryonic seed, I mean one embryotic um, leaf. And so that's what the uh, cotyledon is, an embryonic leaf. So it has one of them. The veins in the leaves are parallel, parallel venation. These are characteristics of monocots. If you were to uh, cut 
a cross section of the stem, you'll see that these little bundles right here, it may not mean much to you at the moment, but these bundles are comprised of specialized vascular tissue called xylem and phloem, and they're sort of arranged randomly in the stem. The roots are often fibrous, like for example, grass, and so they're bran many branches, not a single root, but fibrous. And then the floral parts are arranged in multiples of three. For example, this one has six. So dicotyledons, there's two cotyledons, di means two, a bean is a great example of that, two embryonic leaves. If you look at the venation of a, of a leaf, they're usually net-like or branched like this. If you look at the stem, you can see how the vascular bundles are around the perimeter, and they're in these little packets right there. And then in the roots, there's often one centralized taproot, like i.e. a carrot is usually present, and the floral parts are in fours and fives, or multiples of fours and fives. So not much to say about that other than just recall it. And so the basic morphology of the plant is sort of a, a reflection of its, of its evolution. It, it's specialized below the soil in its root system to obtain water, to anchor the plant, to obtain minerals like this. But then in the air, it's specialized to receive light, so the leaves are or have evolved the ability to capture sunlight and also pick up carbon dioxide. And so um, it's kind of a kind of a trade-off. One requires the other to survive. And so here's a little bit more detail about the, the sheet system. Um, the flower is a reproductive organ, and this is the flowering branch right here. Um, if you look I'll just go down the terms. The terminal bud is at the very top, or terminus. There's a terminal bud at the top of the stem, and there's also terminal buds at the tips of each of the roots. Those are terminal buds, and they're called buds because, I'll, I'll mention this more in a, in a future video, is that there are specialized cells here that are constantly embryonic, and they're capable of dividing. They're called meristematic tissue, and so this is where growth occurs in a plant, primary growth. It grows in this direction right there from the terminal apex. So there's an apical, if you will, an apical bud there and an apical bud at the tips of the root. And so that's primary growth. When I say primary growth, I mean in a downward direction and an upward direction. It's good to have primary growth because then the taller you are, the more sunlight you can get. And the, likewise, if you grow into the soil, you can get more minerals and water this way. The node is the point at which there's branching right here, vegetative and also reproductive branching. So there's a node there, a node there, a node there. And so in between the nodes is the internode. Uh, right below the, the branching here of the petiole, this is the branch of the leaf, the petiole, there's another little bud right there called the axillary bud. And the axillary bud also is made up of the special dividing mitotic tissue called the meristem, but it's sort of uh, dormant. It doesn't produce any branches unless there's some stress to the apical or terminal bud. And so if you're a gardener, uh, you kind of know this. Like, for example, if you took your scissors and you snipped off the, the apical bud or the terminal bud up here, then these axillary buds will start to grow, and so you'll get more branching. And sometimes you want that uh, in your garden. You want more bushy. Than tall. And so reason being is that this apical, I'll come back to this later, but this apical uh, bud produces a hormone called auxin, which causes these to be to remain dormant. And when you clip that off, there's no more ho hormone, and therefore those are free to divide. Um, okay, I'll come down here. So the, the leaf is made up of a blade, which is the flat part right here, and the petiole, which is the leaf branch right there, the petiole. This purple lines inside is, they're trying to show you, although we'll look at more detail later, this is vascular tissue. This is specialized tissue in a plant that conducts water up the plant from the soil, sort of like the elevator sh uh, shaft. And there's also, within vascular tissue, there's also cells that conduct sugar water or, or phloem sap often in a, in a downward direction, depends. It could be an upward or downward direction. It's, it's really from source to, to sink. We'll come back to that later as well. So this is the shoot system above the ground, specialized for reproduction, for capturing sunlight, capturing carbon dioxide. 
Down below is the root system specialized for capturing water, minerals, and uh, stability to sort of anchor the plant down and also storage of energy. So that's kind of cool. Let's continue. <coughs> so both systems really uh, depend on each other. Um, because the roots lack chloroplasts and they live in the dark, they wouldn't live without the shoots producing sugar in the leaves and then sending that sugar down. But likewise, the leaves wouldn't do very well without the ability of the roots to take up water and take up uh, crucial minerals, like for example, iron or magnesium. <coughs> magnesium is really important in chlorophyll, if you recall the structure of that. And so both of this, both um, shoots and, and roots are rather critical, and they, they need each other. They're sort of cooperative to one another. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and so the roots obviously are below the ground. And uh, again, this is probably familiar with you. They, they, they absorb minerals. All those elements that they need, nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, as I just mentioned, iron, uh, copper, all, all of those things. They also absorb lots of water. And they can store food. For example, in their uh, for, uh, carrot is a great example of that. <coughs> uh, many grasses, which are in the, in the monocotyledon sort of family, have fibrous roots, like for example here. And they're, they're kind of thin and they're branched out and they're great for absorbing lots of surface area for absorbing water. And they hold on to the soil, <coughs> which helps the plant to sort of anchor itself. Um, as opposed to a taproot. A taproot is this big central root system. There, there can be branching. But, for example, this is classic dicotyledon root, taproot, right here, and it, it stores lots of food. And, you know, why would it do that? This is a good question. Well, I mean, if the plant is making lots of sugar, it's a good place to store it. It's sort of like the sugar bank down here. And then in, in the next year, it could use that, for example, to flower or, or to produce fruit in the future. So the emphasis that I wanted to say about roots is that in addition to the branching, which increases surface area, each part of the branch of, this is a, a seed right here, the very first part of the, of the root that's coming out of the seed is called the radical. Yes, and it has extensions of its epidermis. So if I were to draw that, like on a, on a cellular level, the epidermis is the cells that make up the outer part right here, and I'll come back to that, but, but they're extensions. And so one cell, instead of it being like this along the side of the root, the cell can actually extend out like that. And so this is called a root hair because think about it. Look at how much more surface area. Absorb water, absorb water, absorb water, absorb water. So these root hairs are rather important to absorbing water, and they extend, giving increased surface area. Um, let me just sort of take you over here and show you, uh, I think this is kind of a cool little video of this. This is uh, obviously time-lapse photography, so it's not obviously growing this quickly when it's germinating. But So the first thing that happens is the root comes out of a seed. I'm not sure if you knew that, because the most important thing is to capture water. Look at, look at the extensive root hairs on there. So not only is it growing downward in this particular area, that's primary growth. But look at the look at the extension of the root hairs there. Let me back that up just a little bit. Um, I mentioned the word cotyledon, which is the first embryonic leaves that are forming right there. And so look at the root and the root hairs. I find that to be kind of interesting. And so let's go back here. If I can go here. And there. Oops. There we are. So this is, again, kind of interesting. This is just the uh, outer epidermis of a root. And you can see here that it's, it's all of this thing that looks like hair is, is really extensions of the epidermal cells. And so this is the root hairs. This maximizes water absorption, but it also ma maximizes mineral uh, absorption as well. So root, roots are kind of wild. Like you can... They can be really thin, like for example, in the, like in grasses, fibrous roots, or they could be really thick. Look at this corn. I mean, it's a type of root that it's called adventitious roots, and they arise above ground. And 
they help prop the stem up. Now you think about it in corn, corn's extremely heavy. It has this massive stem and it has these huge ears of corn. It's very, very heavy. You need these prop roots like this in order to help support. So that's kind of a weird example of roots. Now the shoots, I mentioned some of this before. Above the ground, there's nodes where there's branches, there's inner nodes, there's the axillary buds on the side which are dormant and the terminal bud up here. So the shoots could either have uh, vegetative or leaf-bearing branches or reproductive branches which have flowers. Um, the nodes are where the branches occur and the inner nodes are in between the nodes. This is a real cool picture of a close-up of an axillary bud. Now, you know, this is, there's cells in here, obviously. <laughs> and so the cells in here are, are just hanging out. They're not undergoing cell division because there's, again, a hormone preventing that from occurring. But if you clip off the, the, the apical terminal bud, these cells will start to divide through mitosis, and then this will form a new branch. So that's the axillary bud right there. It's, it's at the base of the petiole. This is the petiole, this is the stem. Here's another picture of that. There's the axillary bud right there. There's the blade, there's the petiole, there's the stem, there's a node. This is the inner node, another node right there. Here's another picture here showing the, uh, the apex or the top of the, of the shoot of the stem. Or the, that's where the terminal bud is. The terminal bud, I won't mention it today, but there's some cool hormone. I mentioned auxin before, but there's some really cool hormone effects uh, occurring from the terminal bud. But it's basically where uh, mitosis is happening. So mitosis, mitosis, mitosis. And so this is primary growth is occurring from the terminal bud. And primary growth is also occurring in the, the terminal bud in the root. So there's two terminal buds. And here's the, ac the lateral bud, sometimes called axillary buds growing off the side here. Node, node, internode. So apical dominance. I mentioned this before. So when you're pruning you, and you want to cut off the, the apical bud or the terminal bud, it, it'll cause those axillary buds to start uh, giving more branching. And so that, that's sometimes some cool if you want to increase your branching. Maybe those branches will contain flowers and, and then you'll have more flowers on your, on your rose bush, for example. Now, let's talk about sort of unusual uh, stems or, 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 or sort of unusual shoots, if you will. Shoots and stems are sort of the same thing. So these are weird ones or sort of modified, if you will. So the modified stems, you can pull this on your friends sometimes and talk about that and say, did you know that shoots can also be stolons, rhizomes, and tubers and bulbs? <laughs> You're like, well, what is this? Well, I think you're familiar with all of these things, but maybe just not the terms. So a stolon is this sort of, on the surface of the ground, they sort of grow laterally. This is strawberries. I don't know if you recognize it, but these are called runners. And so this is a sort of a weird stem because it's growing along here, and these are the, the branches. So that's called the stolon. They're or runners. They help them to sort of colonize new areas and spread out, capture more sun. Rhizomes, uh, oh, more strawberries, and so all these little above-the-ground shoots are stolons. This is a, a bed of strawberries. Um, ginger is a great example of uh, a rhizome. I don't know if you, if you like ginger on your food, or sometimes uh, pickled ginger is good at, for, uh, on sushi. But it's not a root. It's actually a stem, and so, but, it, but it grows under the ground. So that's kind of interesting. So here's the, here's the leaves, and here's the stem, and here's the roots. So rhizome. And then you have tubers. <laughs> now tubers are known, most famous tuber of them all is a potato. So potato is not a root. A potato is a modified shoot. In other words, it's a stem, and it's swollen, and it stores lots of starch. Uh, and plant, plants like, to, like potatoes use that. Uh, to grow the, the next year. We tend to harvest, in other words, like dig up the potatoes that are growing, the stems are growing under the ground because we like to eat the potato for the starch value. Bulbs are also, like an onion, bulbs are also 
modified stems. They store starch in their, in their sort of uh, this particular structure here. The, the stem would, the leaves are above and the roots are below. And so here's a, a rhizome of the, the flower, the iris. And so here's the leaves, flower would grow from here. So this is a modified stem. And then bulbs are, again, specialized stems. <laughs> Uh, these these bulbs or are, 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 are tubers, if you will, are, are great gifts. You can just you know, give someone this, and you just put it in soil and water, or rocks and water, and it'll uh, just start to grow. It's great. Little roots will start to grow below, and then the, the leaves will emerge here, and then a cool flower. So leaves, I mentioned this before, uh, some can be these big, flat, big blades. Now, Big blades are characteristic of an environment that has lots of rainfall. Like, for example, in the tropics, where there's high rainfall, you can get away with that. So the goal of the blade is to capture sunlight for photosynthesis. So it's like, wow, I would like to have a large blade. But you can't pull that off if there's no water. <laughs> you got to have lots of water because there's a lot of water loss from a large blade. And then the petiole is the branch of the, of the leaf. And so you can either have parallel venation, if you recall, is a classic example of monocot. So for example, corn and grass. Or you can have sort of branching netted venation for dicot. And then, um, you know, if you've ever seen one of these little books to help you identify what plants are, what kind of tree you're dealing with, or what kind of, kind of bush it is, it's called a dichotomous key. It's either this or this or this or this. You'll find that the leaves are kind of a, a way in which you could sort of classify plants. Uh, botanists use that, taxonomists. So if it, there's a, a single blade, it's called a simple leaf. There's the petiole there, axillary bud. So simple, as opposed to a compound leaf. So this is still the petiole. So this is considered to be just one leaf. Isn't that interesting? So the fact that it has many little leaflets, leaflets, it means that it's a compound leaf, or more than one, so it's not simple, but it's still considered to be one full leaf like this. And then it's a doubly compounded, so each leaflet also has little uh, minor leaflets coming off of it right there. And so you can sort of classify whether or not the leaflets are opposite or um, staggered to one another, if you're into that sort of thing. And then finally, um, some plants, their leaves are, some oddities is that sometimes the leaves will like coil around particular structures like uh, if you have a pergola, if you're growing grapes or if you're growing beans or, or peas, um, you'll notice that the, the leaves will, will, will sort of coil and cling to, uh, to different uh, structures. And some, some leaves can be specialized to store large amounts of water. That's kind of interesting. And then some leaves are modified for defensive purposes. Like, for example, the thorns of a cactus are not photosynthetic. Cactus photosynthesizes with its stem. So there's chloroplasts in the stem, not in the leaves. Um, it's so hot, you would you'd lose so much water in the desert, so why not just prot protect yourself with these, with these leaves? And then what's fascinating here is that some leaves can even be so colorful that they attract pollinators. And so we call those... <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed that first slideshow on the basics of plant body. Thanks for watching.